All right. So we've done a bunch of talks um, on Haskell in the time we've been running the group. Some of them introductory, um, using GHCI and things like that. Uh, some of them are more complicated about uh, the sort of data types, algebraic data types and things like that. I wanted to do a talk a little bit more about how to write Haskell programs and the tools you sort of use to do it. Um, as opposed to using it as a tool for sort of learning how to write uh, a nice functional program code. So just kind of general tools. Um, and, and my summary is that Haskell really has excellent tooling, which I didn't see before I started using it. I thought, you know, come, particularly coming from a bit of a Java background where you've got great IDEs, um, you know, sort of Ant works, there are dependency management systems like Maven and Ivy, and I didn't see a bunch of that around Haskell. And to some extent it wasn't there when I started learning, and it's now sort of all the infrastructure's in place, so it really does have, have good tooling. Um, and it all starts with this, the Haskell platform, um, which I think started uh, early last year, and it's a kind of a one-click installer for, um, for the OS's, easy on Windows, easy on OS X, not so easy on Ubuntu, but I think in the latest Meerkat release it's, it's a bit better and you kind of just install it. Gives you a compiler, gives you a set of base libraries that you can kind of depend depend on, and you know that anyone who's got the platform has all those. So it's sort of simplified uh, distribution of Haskell platforms, uh, Haskell programs, quite a bit. Um, so that's what I'm talking about first. There's a bunch of tools around building and distributing. So when you're first kind of writing a Haskell program, you might start off a little bit like this. So you just kind of got one source file, compile it with GHC, take the output. I don't know if I can't remember if it gives you all some numbers, the name of the binary of which just gives you an A dot output or whatever. Yeah, something like that. So you work with that for a bit and start pulling stuff out to new files. GHC is not picking them up. So you start working with GHC dash dash make, which is pretty cool. So it's a kind of a make system built into GHC itself, which will look at that source file, and that'll be where your main method is defined. And then go out and find the dependencies of that. So if you've got other modules in directories like uh, awesomemap.util, in also map util like hs, uh, it'll find it and compile it, build it all, and it, it sort of you know everything kind of works from there. But it's a bit messy. If you run this afterwards, you end up with a bunch of intermediate Haskell files just littered throughout the place. It doesn't collect them all into one place. Uh, wherever your source file is, you'll have one hi and one dot o. Um, so you can start cleaning that up a little bit with GHC. So make your file, start passing in hiders passing an output directory, kind of cleaned up a little bit. But at that point, your command line starts looking pretty gnarly and long. Maybe wrap it up in a shell script. Easier ways to get started with Cabal, which is the, the make system um, for Haskell programs. So it's, it reminds me a little bit probably of Maven, and that's, it's one tool that sort of does everything around building your Haskell program. It's got your metadata, it's got the name, description, version. Uh, it's got your list of dependencies, so the libraries you depend on. Um, and what versions of them. Um, you give it your license, so potentially it can do license analysis and tell you which libraries are compatible and which libraries aren't, if things happen to be LGPL or BSD and things like that. Um, and getting started with it's really easy. Uh, you run, it comes with the Haskell platform. Uh, you might have to add a directory to your path, but that'd be deal. Create a new folder, empty folder, or wherever your files are, run Cabal with it, It'll ask you a bunch of questions. Then configure and build is kind of the process you usually go through. Whenever you change your Cabal spec file, you run configure. Whenever you modify your source, you run build. And it groups up your apps nicely in, in disk. And if you're already just writing source in the root of the folder, just like we had before, our awesome app.hs, rename that to main, or specify that in your, uh, your Haskell your Cabal file. It'll pick it all up and, and just keep working the way you are. So it's really easy to kind of just drop into a folder or source and keep going with Cabal. The great thing it does, though, is it allows you to share your, your, your program then, or your library. So it specifies, Cabal, you specify whether or not it's a library or an executable, what modules you're exporting, um, what dependencies it has, and then if you've got an account up on Hackage, which is the sort of central package repository for Haskell code, you can go and upload the file, uh, ask for the username and password, bam, you're done. So I've got a project called Kit. Um, which I can upload to. And then for a user to go and install Kit, the latest version, all they do is come in and run Cabal install Kit, as long as they've got the platform. And you know, it goes and grabs all the dependencies that Kit has, builds them on the file, installs the binary. Kit's a, a, um, 
an executable project, um, produces an executable. And it's actually a dependency manager for Objective C code that, that we use um, internally in mode generation. So it's a bit like Cabal, but for Objective C and it wraps around Xcode, does a bunch of cool stuff. So if you do want to ask anything, come talk to me. Um, so the next set of tools, once you've kind of got it all building and working really nicely, you want to be able to go out and find libraries to work with and, and code that really helps you. So as I've already mentioned, there's Hackage. So Hackage is the, package, is the central Haskell code repository. Um, and this is Kit up in Lights. So there's a page where you can go and you can look through, browse through every package it's got. They're grouped by category. Um, gives you a sort of short description. So if, you, if you're looking for a library to help you deal with you know, not ads. You can go up here and see what util libraries are around dealing with network. You can go and find what network packages are available. Um, it's missing sort of some crowdsourcing stuff, so you don't really get an idea about what's popular um, from this. But uh, one of the one of the big names in the Haskell community, Don Stewart, has been building some reports about what uh, what packages are popular. Um, just manual by now, and he did one three or four months ago, and that's available, so you can kind of see what's being dependent upon, and Hackage has just been rewritten, I think, on the inside, so hopefully we'll see some, some changes come out of that. So at the moment, there are over 2,000 packages on Hackage. It's up from 1,100 in early 2009, so it's growing pretty rapidly. Uh, around about a dozen of them are updated today, whether that's new or updates to existing libraries, I'm not sure. Um, so that's not too many to not be able to track yourself. So you can follow Hackage on Twitter and get an idea about what's changed. Um, or you can join the Haskell IRC channel and see what HackageBot says. So whenever anyone you know, does an update, that comes in. And that's been really handy for me managing the, the, the kit tool because you know, it starts in conversations. People see kit, this weird thing, what the hell he's doing in Haskell with Objective-C. And, and you know, it's a good way to kind of engage new users and things like that. So they're good ways to kind of follow what's happening on Hackage. So apart from packages, you want to be able to search the APIs. That's kind of the next thing. You want to find specific functions to help you out at different points. So there's a tool called Hey You. I hope I'm talking about it. I guess it's like a Yahoo with the letters flat, flipped. Um, and it lets you search for functions by sort of name and where they might be. So we can search for the map function. Um, we can look for it in particular packages, uh, which will be different packages on package, different modules. So a module might be implemented across many packages. So you can search for one module and know what package it's implemented in. Um, and there's a bunch of other modifiers. By default, map searches dis uh, description and comments and all sorts of stuff. So you can limit it just to function name with, with the name modifier at the front. This is the kind of output it gives you. It gives you a bit of a tag cloud to see what functions are most, most common for that keyword. So it's doing a, you know, um, uh, sort of like a substream search, sub search on each, each list, each match. Um, and we can see that all the results we got back are for functions that m match map with the name map. So the first one we got back is list, uh, which is great because it's probably what, with list map, which is great because it's probably what we were after. Um, and then a bunch of other ones that kind of map the type system a little bit, but it's really just checking on the map name, which is alright, except, you know, it's just doing a name search and we're, in, we're using Haskell. It's, uh, it's got a really great type system. A lot of information in this in about functions can be gleaned from the types, and we should be able to search on that. So that's where Google comes in. <laughs> so Google is the greatest tool I've ever used, I, I reckon, for writing code. Um, you're writing Haskell code. You know you want a particular function. You've got no idea what name it is, but you know how the type signature should fit in your code. So you go to Google and you plug it in. So we're looking for that. We're looking for a, fun uh, a function that takes a function for A to B's list of A's and gives us a list of B's. We know it's a map, maybe we didn't realise what the name was, this is the operation we need. So we search, and this is what Hoover looks like. You can see straight away, it's pulled out sort of the parts of the function that we're searching for and highlighted them, so you can kind of match up the green through to see where it's matched that up. If, if things were flipped, it doesn't care about the flipped function as well, so if the function was in here for instance and the list of A's came first, it would know that that's equivalent and it can just flip between the two. Um, again, it's pulled up our project.map. First up, exact match, the same with data.list. I think it uses <coughs> project because it's more general, it's there by default without imports, and then this. 
And then it's given us alternatives where the type signature is similar but not quite the same. So parallel map, where we have to pass in a strategy first, so it's taking an extra parameter. But apart from that, apart from the first parameter, everything matches the same. And then it's recognized that a list of A's can be generalized to a higher kind of functor. And it's given us functor F map, which is exactly the same operation generalized on, on the F there. So that's really good, you know, for finding the function, for finding when you can apply generalizations, uh, abstractions, um, who knows where you go. And it got even better when I realized there was a command line tool for Google. So you can Kabbalah install it, you can run it, you can change the database to include all your local packages, or your code, your new code, the, the libraries you're working on. Um, and then the output of this is kind of some little website. You know, add a command into TextMate, whatever you're using, get a little pop-up sort of suggestions. Um, really good. Uh, so that's that's kind of it for discovering code. Um, I want to talk a little bit about improving code, but this is kind of where I'm weakest on, I think. Um, I haven't used the tools too much here. But there are a couple of things that just kind of help you write. You can just run on your code and help you write better things, better Haskell. First one's hlib. Um, it's a, bit, a little bit like similar um, programs to JavaScript or C++ or C. Uh, and it's really kind of a syntax, syntax uh, cleaner. So if you write a function where do notation was unnecessary, it would tell you about it. If you add extra parentheses, it'll tell you how you can drop them. Um, and a few other things like that. So it's kind of nice to make sure your code is clean before a check-in. Um, you can run hlint on it, um, have that part of your build, things like that. Uh, but I haven't used it much past that, so it, it might very well do more, but that's all I've used it for. The other one is LambdaBot on Haskell. So it's been worked on for, I don't know how long, 10 years maybe. It's, um, it's an awesome little bot. It's a little bit like GHCI with a whole bunch of plugins. So some of the GHCI, you can do a type, write out your function, and it'll tell you what the type of the function is. You can ask it for what the source of some of the functions are in preview, and it'll stick them out. So if you want to know how map is implemented, you can go, ask, go and ask LambdaBot. Um, you can look for kinds, to get it to tell you the kind of the function, find out instances, type classes, a uh, whole bunch of things like that. Um, but perhaps the two of the things that really jumped out at me, which I haven't used much, but are these two, two tools, at PL and at unpl, um, which are for turning code from point free into unpoint free code and back again. So I'll give some examples because I'm not quite clear on the strict definition of point free. Um, at the moment. Here was a is a play on the terms and means pointless. pointless. So the correct right, is point free. And someone said let's call it pointless. Okay. Pointless. <laughs> Alright, pointless and unpointless. Yeah. Um, so to make your code pointless, point free, you pass it a function and the way I think about it is it's kind of dropping the values out and giving you a function is exactly, exactly equivalent in Haskell syntax, giving you a function where you take taking class, applying one value, and returning a function that takes another value and adds it to plus as well, or applies that to it as well. Is that clear? So the type of these two is exactly the same. It's just a mechanical transformation into different Haskell syntax, which drops out the named values so into the shorthand. And this is nice for kind of cleaning things up and making things really short. Um, but I have used this one much more when I'm reading other people's code. So this is take point free code and then desugar it back into pointed functions, I guess, where, where the names are all explicit. So I, I mean, at the moment, I find this pretty hard to read. Um, you know, it's calling show first, and then we're appending some value to it. And I know that now because I've looked at it you know, all day as I was writing slides or whatever. Um, but it, it's not till you kind of run it through on point three, pulls out the value, you can see, right, okay, so we're calling show on the value, plus plus, concatenate with the next bit. So. Is that on PL? Is that through Landable? Yeah, that's on Landable as well. Yeah. And can all install that as well? Yes. So yeah. both point three, <laughs> both PL and unpl. So that's PL, that's unpl. Um, can be installed by Cabal. So once again, you can get Cabal line tools to do these little clean up things, stick them in your builds, stick them in text commands. Um, that's what I've done. 
Um, yeah, and that, that's about it, I think. So there's a whole bunch of tools out there once you kind of get to know them. Um, LambdaBot encapsulates a bunch of them, so it's kind of interesting to see what LambdaBot can do. Um, he can Google as well, and hey you, I think, so you can kind of see both searches, um, and a bunch of things like that. So hang out in the Haskell channel if you've got some time and, and sort of see what happens. That's a good way of sort of picking up what other people are doing, um, what other people are sort of trying out. Um, get on package. Yeah, that's me. Nick, did you try installing LambdaBot? I mean, huh? we tried doing it a couple of years ago. And yeah. It was much pain and agony. I, I tried it again because I've tried it before. And I tried it again, and you can, it's on package now, so you can do a Cabal install LambdaBot. Okay. But then it's it had all sorts of conflicts, conflicts yeah. with base package versions being right out of date and on it. Yeah. yeah I not, have it on a VMware image, and it, that <laughs> took me ages. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Right. Actually, in the days that LambdaBot went down, so there's only, I think there's only one guy in the world who runs Lambda Body Saints, and tiny, <laughs> two people in the world. Who run <laughs> and about, I was started kind of thinking about this on Friday, and Lambda Bot went down, and so I couldn't play with any of this stuff over the weekend. I didn't realise you could cabal install things until the point free and the unpoint free, um, point full, sorry, tools until this morning. Uh, so I couldn't play with any of it, and I was like, oh, shit. And then at about midday today, it came back up, so I was able to start playing with it again. But yeah, so. It's good when he keeps running, and it'd be nice if someone else could run it too. You should have pinned me, mate. Yeah. <laughs> We've got an internal IRC server, and it's... it's oh, you've got to there. connect to that. Oh, right. Oh, no, okay. I could have just... I could have just told it to connect out. Yeah, yeah. Like three node or something, and you just write a message with it. Yep. All right, next time. If my yeah, robot goes down, go down again, the only other copy that's running. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>